How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Holy smokes, we got a lot to talk about here on the show today. It is Wednesday, and you know what that means. We have got AEW Dynamite coming up tonight. And, you know, Paul Heyman's got a catchphrase. This is not a prediction. It's a spoiler. I got my own catchphrase. This is not a spoiler, but it is a prediction. I think tonight's going to be a big show, and I'll tell you why as we get going here today. It is the Quake of the Lake. We've got an interim world title match and and a lot more, so we'll talk about that. Obviously, we must talk about the death of Judo Jean LaBelle. I got a special surprise after the break, too, involving Judo Jean LaBelle. Passed away at the age of 89 years old. We've got more on Vince McMahon, which with all due respect to Judo Jean LaBelle, I mean, in some ways, this is the biggest story because they have uncovered more payouts. It's now up to $19.6 million. And this is all, I mean, there's so much going on because of this now. WWE is having to delay filings to the SEC. The gist of it is this guy's never coming back. I mean, if you thought there was any chance that he was going to try to run this thing behind the scenes or that at some point he was going to come back, he's done. The Vince McMahon era over. We'll tell you about that here today. We have also got Kevin Dunn notes. We've got raw ratings, which are still doing very, very well. We have got Ric Flair now admitting he passed out twice during his final match. We'll tell you what he blamed it on and more. And of course, we have the AW or the NXT 2.0 report from uh, Tuesday night. We've got injuries on that show. We've got angles sitting up next week. And plenty more. So, lots to get into. We will kick it off after the break. Stick around, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Judo Jean LaBelle, best known for his catch wrestling technique that later became an influence in both pro wrestling and mixed martial arts, passed away at 89. Boss Rutten wrote that LaBelle had passed away. Deepest condolences to his Lovely wife, Midge, kids, all his other family members and friends. You will be greatly missed, Gene. I love you, my friend, till we meet again. He started catch wrestling at the age of seven, trained under Ed Strangler Lewis, later trained in judo. He was also trained by the likes of Carl Gotch, Lou Thez. 1963, he accepted a challenge fight boxer Milo Savage in an early mixed martial arts bout that saw LaBelle score the win with a rear naked choke. In pro wrestling, he ran NWA's Los Angeles Territory, NWA Hollywood Wrestling. From 1968 through 1982, he also served as the referee for the Muhammad Ali and Tony Inoki match that took place in 1976. Wrestled his final pro wrestling match in 1981 against Peter Maivia in NWA Hollywood Wrestling. By the way, that's a mistake in our uh, front page. He did not run NWA's Los Angeles Territory. Mike LaBelle ran the territory, but he did not. In recent years, he'd accompanied Ronda Rousey to the ring during mixed martial arts matches and judged MMA fights through 2018. So if I may for a moment here, Mike Sempervivi will get your thoughts here in a moment, but uh, there's actually kind of a tie-in, a strange tie-in between me and Judo Jean LaBelle. So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but... uh, I was really into big, big into pro wrestling when I was a youngster, and uh, we had a, a backyard promotion, the YWF, and I started doing this in like 1992, 1993, we were doing all these shows, me and my buddies and everything like that, and I was a huge fan of, of you know, Mr. Perfect and Bret Hart and all these great small technical wrestlers, and I always wanted to, like I would watch them do these, I'll never forget, there was a match, and I cannot remember who was in it, but I remember, I remember Gorilla Monsoon was doing commentary. And somebody did this move, and Gorilla Monsoon said it was the sugar hold. And I was like, it's just the weirdest thing. I had to learn the sugar hold. What is this sugar hold? So, you know, back then, you know, UFC started in in 93, and I started watching UFCs regularly in 95. But, you know, 92, 93, you couldn't just say, hey, Mom, I want to learn jujitsu. Let's just go to a jujitsu school. They didn't have them. I would have had to go to, like, 
L.A. and have Hoy stretch me in his garage or something like that. But anyway, so I wanted to learn how to do all these moves. But there was nowhere to go to learn all this technical wrestling that I wanted to learn. And, you know, I went out for amateur wrestling and in junior high, but, you know, I sucked at it. And I didn't learn any holds. They were just trying to show me how to pin people. I want to learn holds. I wanted to learn submissions. Because I watched these on these uh, these rest these technical wrestlers, these you know perfect and Bret Hart did all this stuff, and so I go to the library, and uh, I found a book on amateur wrestling, and it didn't show me anything. I, I still was like, God, what? How can I find out how to do this stuff? I had no answers to the question. So I used to love going to used bookstores. For those of you that know what those are, they used to exist. They were books that were old, used. And you could go and find out what you wanted. And uh, I go to this used bookstore, and all of a sudden, I mean, it was like, you know, you, you see the light at the end of the tunnel after the heart attack? I saw the Lord of Pro Wrestling. I found Pro Wrestling, you hear that? Pro Wrestling Finishing Holds by Judo Jean LaBelle. Not just wrestling, Pro Wrestling Finishing holds. It was like my brain exploded. I, I mean, apparently it was at a book sale for the Everett Public Library. Everett Pr Public Library, October 1989. You checked that out, but never returned it. You lying, somebody? <laughs> no, I don't think I don't think I checked it out. I think it was at a, a used bookstore. But and there he is. There's old Judo Jean Labelle, huh? Signed. So anyway, I start looking through oh. this book, and chapter one. Grabbing your own hands for hugging, squeezing, and ripping. Chapter 2, pressure against the back and spine. Chapter 3, neck locks and cranks. Chapter 4, rib crushing. Chapter 5, chokes, neck strangles, and neck holds. Chapter 6, leverages against the wrist joint and finger locks. Chapter 7, abdominal pain. Chapter 8, head crush varieties. Chapter 9, arm, elbow, and shoulder locks. Chapter 10, ankle, knee, groin stretches, and hip locks. Chapter 11, some of the best illegal holds in the world. Huh? Chapter 12, the LaBelle slap and catch. 140 pages, dude. Like, look at this. How to move into the, the standing Argentinian backbreaker, the bear hug using the chest. Uh, my favorite somewhere in here, I'm sure you guys have all heard this story at some point, where I learned how to do the double ouch. Huh? The double ouch? Explain I'm, the double ouch. I'm going to go through this one, by the way, as I get ready for this uh, <laughs> match with uh, Filthy Tom. But the thing is, these are pro wrestling finishing holds, but the reality is there's like a ton of catch wrestling and jiu-jitsu in here. And obviously you're not going to learn catch wrestling or jiu-jitsu from, from reading a book because... I could teach anybody how to apply a Kimura, but that's all fine. You could apply a Kimura, but trying to apply a Kimura against an opponent who's trying to oppose, that's the trick. The trick is to get it on somebody who doesn't want you to put it on him. Anybody can learn how to apply a Kimura. But uh, here's the rear naked choke. He explains how to do this, which, by the way, when I started jiu-jitsu, uh, the very first submission I ever got was a rear naked choke because I'd done the sleeper hold so often. It was my buddy Guy. We were rolling, and I caught him in a sleeper hold, and I tapped him. I'll never forget that. Figure four neck lock. So anyway, I was obsessed with this stuff. And then, of course, you know, in, in 2005, I had an apartment, and uh, right down the road, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, um, it was actually a Wing Chun school, but they had a, uh, a Pedro Sauer, uh, at the time, he was not a black belt. But uh, so I went there and I started training and the rest is history. So I can actually almost in some way thank Judo Jean LaBelle for my own black belt is the point I'm trying to make here. Because if I had not found this book, I would never have. They got Kimuras in here. They got arm bars. They got all this stuff. And man, I was obsessed. With, is this the double ouch? No, this is the elbow squeeze with scissors. But anyway, this book, I don't know what this book is worth nowadays. But I'll never sell it. Golly. And then, of course, you know, Ronda Rousey. And, man, sad to see Judah. But 89 years old. He lived a long life. So it's always nice to hear, uh, you know, when someone didn't die under 40. But uh, all the best to the friends and family of Judo Gene. And 
I want to thank Judo Gene personally for writing this book, which in some ways actually kind of a little bit did change my life. He's one of those guys that I didn't get until later on because of that book that you're talking about. I have hundreds of books on wrestling. I wish I had that one. They used to advertise that in the wrestling magazines. But you never got any coverage of Gene LaBelle really as a wrestler. Maybe something, you know, a, a photograph here or there of him with Ali or him with Carl Gotch or him with somebody or him interviewing somebody in NWA Hollywood. But I didn't know about him as a wrestler. So I would see that book, and I believe it was the Judo and Self Defense uh, book as well, too, that would be in the magazines. And you see that goofy face of his, and it's like him and Mondo Guerrero, and I kind of blew it off. And then you see him in the magazines because they never got covered. So Mando Guerrero was was teaching the glow women, and I believe LaBelle had something to do with that. He would always help people out in Hollywood when he came to wrestling scenes and scenes like that. He was the go-to guy. But I didn't really, it didn't sink in until the rise of MMA. Because much like Carl Gotch, as I started to understand Japanese professional wrestling more, and as I started to understand the rise of mixed martial arts, and you... To a person, forget about the wrestlers that were in Southern California or in that area, all of the fighters that this guy influenced. And we talk a lot with wrestlers when the UFC was strong and wrestling was weak about what would you have done? When it comes to like, when it comes to Carl, when it comes to Carl Gotch, when it comes to Gene LaBelle, like he was the originator of this stuff. You go back and then you study his history, the Milo Savage fight. All of that stuff, I can't do him any justice. I hope Paul Lazenby and Lance Storm and every single body else that this person touched in any sort of way, including everybody from SoCal, has their stories, publishes their stories, because he was an amazing figure. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. We can talk more about Gene if we have time later, but a couple of things. WWE has uncovered more previously undisclosed payments made by Vince. SEC filing Tuesday. Two additional payments McMahon agreed to make in 2007 and 2009 have been uncovered. We're now up to $19.6 million. WWE has determined that payments should have been recorded in the company's financial statements with the two additional payments uncovered. WWE notified the SEC Tuesday it will be late in filing its second quarter financial report for this year. They also have to revise 2019, 2020, and 2021, and its report for the first quarter of 2022. All of the payments, quote, were or will be paid by Vince McMahon personally. WWE wrote in the filing the company anticipates it will file its second quarter financial report within the five-day extension period, blah, blah, blah. Dude, this guy's done. He's done. He's not coming back. He's not pulling the strings behind the scenes. He's done. And I don't know this, obviously, but my guess is this ain't it. I mean, I could be wrong, but, I mean, they keep looking and they keep finding more. $19.5 million. So the next time you have a few spare dollars and maybe you go to the casino or, you know, throw some bucks in the air at the strip club or whatever your whatever your personal vice is just remember you did not spend three thousand one hundred and forty nine dollars a day every day for 16 years to pay off women and the stock is up 15 percent in the last month it is $72. $72. Well, their stock with me is up about 100% after he left. To well, be fair. I, I get what you're saying. Believe me, I absolutely know what you're saying. But it also shows you the bubble. And I wonder the more that comes out, unless one of these stories like the real sports, something has got something where the public can attach something. I... It's almost like the more that comes out, the more they celebrate, you know, stockholders, the fact, well, he's not there to do this anymore, and we're going to continue to buy in. It's just, it's something else. It's amazing that even with the reports that have, you know, Variety is covering this more now, other people are covering this more now, that 
nothing's hurting that stock price. And I'm not looking at this as anything other than just that, not whether it's right or wrong or any of that stuff, but you would see some negative fluctuation with almost anybody. And from the time this thing started, for the most part, except for a short few hours, this thing has not only rebounded back, it's actually climbed higher. So it's it's really something else. He's actually benefiting, still being the number one stockholder in that company, of all of the carnage that he created. And that really, again, shines a really bright, obnoxious and needed light on the culture and the environment of that place. Something that has been whispered about and talked about f for a long, long time. <laughs> that, that really does need to be fixed. And whatever process they're going to go through, again, they haven't even we haven't even gotten a final report from the board, at least that we know of, of what their findings actually are. Because they're not and done. You, and that's the thing, as you mentioned, we keep getting more and more and more of this. So it is still a fascinating story that's going to continue on. But again, purely from a money point of view, he's actually, again, not really making out, quote unquote, but he's certainly other people feeling results for their actions <laughs> you know, I don't know if he's ever really going to feel him. We'll see. You know, Count Billy Vargas here. In my youth. Billy Varga. Uh, you Vargas. know, there's, there's uh, typos Fernando. here and there. <laughs> In my youth, I've spent thousands of dollars traveling the world to learn the best finishing holds. Now LaBelle shows all of these finishing holds and more for only the price of a book? It doesn't seem fair. <laughs> these are Look, some, of, these are some I great... Find those... uh, those ads. Hopefully Carl Stern has some ready to go up or something like that. The ads from the magazines. And by the way, if you're looking for that book, you can still probably find some earlier editions out there. But I believe the name of that book has changed over time. I think he made it more of a grappling or jujitsu based book, which, as Brian explained, makes a lot more sense. And if you went through L.A. and you were in Hollywood or you got your SAG card or any of that stuff, you probably ran through Gene LaBelle. And again, it's the stories from the fighters. It's the stories from the, the real hardcore wrestlers. Those guys, they're the ones you got to hear. Jonathan Snowden writing about him in the Shooter's book. That's another book that you can, if you're looking for information on G Gene LaBelle from a book that's not that old, that you can still get pretty much, I believe it's in wide you know, circulation. That's one I think you should run and go to. But... It's amazing. And I hope Scott Walton, Scott Walton's another one. I'm sure Dave will talk to him for the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, but obviously Walton, a longtime fixture down in Southern California, I'm sure he's got a ton of stories as well, too. It's just, it's an area that unless you're really into the 70s wrestling magazines, you won't see a lot about that area. But again, it's the second biggest city and the wrestling was a little bit different there because it was Hollywood, but it's just, it's, he's just an amazing figure and all of the work he did in Hollywood, all of that, everything with the cauliflower alley club, all that sort of stuff. It, just an amazing larger than life figure. So tonight is AW dynamite quake at the lake. We have got John Moxley, Chris Jericho for the AW interim title. Jade Cargill versus Madison Rain, Darby Allen versus Brody King in a coffin match, Lucha Brothers versus Andrade in a Roosh Tornado Tag Team match, Ricky Starks, Aaron Solo, and an appearance by FTR. And as I noted at the beginning of the show, this is not a spoiler, but it is a prediction. I think this is going to be a big show tonight. Why? Well, when this show is over... They have three Wednesdays left before All Out. Three. We have one match official for All Out. One. So between now and three weeks from now, we need an AW championship match. We need literally to begin and get all the way to the finals of a six-man tag team tournament because the finals are at All Out. And then obviously there are, there are multiple titles, and we need to have matches. There's so much that needs to be done between now and All Out that this thing just needs to explode tonight. And if it doesn't, I mean, they're running out of time. So 
obviously the big thing is Moxley and Jericho, and it is for the interim title. And what are they going to do? Well, I don't know. But here's the deal. If CM Punk is ready to go for All Out, he needs to be back quick. I don't know if that means tonight. I don't know if that means next week. But it has to. It literally has to be either tonight or next week. Otherwise, you're just waiting too long. So there's that. If he's not, if, if CM Punk is not ready for All Out, then you've got to figure out, well, what are we going to do for a championship match? Obviously, John Moxley, Chris Jericho, it's been two years in the making for this rematch. So if Punk isn't ready, are you going to do something involving this match for All Out? Which would mean, could Chris Jericho win the title here? And then the rematch is it all out with some sort of stip or something like that? Is John Moxley going to beat Jericho? And then somebody is going to show up to to face Moxley at all out? There's something has to happen either tonight or at the very at the very latest next week. I would think it would be tonight after the match. If Jericho wins, then obviously you've got an angle for all out. If Moxley wins, I think somebody should probably show up tonight. And if not, they got to show up at the beginning of the show next week. And then what in God's name is going on with the trios titles? We got three weeks after tonight. There's nothing on the lineup tonight about trios titles, which would mean the trios tournament needs to start next week, which means you'll have three weeks to run this tournament. Obviously, you can do matches on Rampage as well. But, uh, you know, obviously from the beginning, Tony Khan has said, I'm not doing six-man titles until Omega's back. So Omega, if Omega's coming back for this tournament, is it tonight? Are they going to actually do it on Rampage? Is it going to be next week? Like, we need to know now! So anyway, because of all of that, I think that it's going to be a, uh, a pretty big show tonight. I think something's happening tonight. And then obviously they've got to do a bunch of stuff between now and All Out. So I think if you've been... Uh, you know, I think the last two weeks of Dynamite have been good. I thought two weeks ago was was great. I thought last week was really good. So I'm actually very bullish about the next four weeks of AEW television because they got a lot to do to get ready for All Out. Yeah, the only concern is will the TV be too busy and be too spastic out there, you know, with too much going on because sometimes they do shove too much into a show. But for the reasons that you mentioned – You've got to start it up right now. You've got to get this thing going. It's only three weeks. You can't just depend on the fact that it's sold out and that that pay-per-view is going to have a lot of interest. And I need to know what's going on with their champion. Give me an update on CM Punk. Give me something on CM Punk, kayfabe, anything. Let me know this guy still exists, for heaven's sakes. And I think moving the belt to Jericho, I think, is a big mistake, even if... Even if Moxley is out, or even if CM Punk is out, because I think in the back of your pocket you have MJF, and I think you would be much better off if there's no Jericho there and you have Moxley have a match with somebody other than Punk. I would make it MJF at the pay per view. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sembravivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. Yes, Mike. Since we have it up on the website now, since we've been doing the show, the Pacific Rim Pro Wrestling Podcast with Fumi Saito and the host of this very show, Jim Valley, on Saturday afternoons, uh, East Coast time, have a new show up talking uh, about several things, but one of the main things is Judo Gene LaBelle, and those are two guys who would know a little something about Judo Gene LaBelle. Obviously, Fumi being a reporter in Japan for many, many years, he talks about the Ali Inoki match and about LaBelle's influence there, and I'm sure Jim has got some stories as well, two years of going to the Cauliflower Alley Club, so... They've got some other things that they talk about as well with the modern scene, but uh, I just saw that go up on the website. So, again, it would be behoove you, as that is a free download for all of you, whether you are a member of the Mighty Empire or not, to take a listen to uh, whenever you get a chance, because I guarantee you it's going to be good. A couple of quick notes, and then we'll uh, do NXT. Raw Monday uh, did very well. It was down from SummerSlam. But 1.96 million viewers, a .54 in 18 to 49. It was first on cable. Beat every show on television 18 to 49 except The Bachelorette. And uh, compared to the same week last year, 
up 10% in total viewers, 11% in 18 to 49, with fewer homes having access to USA. So the actual increase over last year is up 16% in viewers and 18% in 18 to 49. So these are very good numbers for WWE. Tony Khan said that he will not be moving to two-day pay-per-views. Thank God. I can still go to AEW shows. And actually admitted he didn't even know where that story came from. It came from Dustin. And he had no idea what was going on. This has got to stop with Tony Khan doing interviews where he reveals somebody has either undercut him or slipped up or did something he didn't like. (laughs) No, it's like it was the production team. It was this. It was that. And now Dustin... Who I apparently really baffled Tony because he has no idea where he must have pulled that out of. He said it may have been a floating idea in a meeting or something like that. But how it got to the point that it did, he doesn't know. But look, thank God. WWE wants to do two-day pay-per-views. That's fine. AEW, look, you got the whole weekend anyway. There's really no need for them to do that. NXT 2.0. It's a pretty good show. Although, yes, everybody's talking about Nikita Lyons, Mike. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? Your argument yesterday aged well, let me tell you. Oh, yeah? But you know what? I'm going to defend you a little bit. You should. All I heard about last night was Nikita Lyons botching this spot in this match, and I was just just waiting. And when I finally saw it, I was like, that's it? Dude, she botched the spot, don't get me wrong. But what she was trying to do, and I'm trying to remember, I think uh, Ivar does this where you do the running cannonball in the corner, and then as you roll down, you basically just do a backward roll. Well, she got caught in the ropes, and so she grabbed the top rope, and she flipped out and grabbed her again. I mean, listen, it was a botched spot, don't get me wrong, and if I were there, I would tell her never to do that spot ever. But, I mean, given that she botched it and honestly just moved on like nothing had happened, I was like, that's it? That's the big catastrophe with Nikita Lyons? The match itself... Listen, I'm not going to tell you that that match, Nikita Lyons and Keanu James, was good. It was it was a total indie match, and and worse, Keanu it's James. Okay to say it wasn't. She good. lost. I couldn't even believe that. But uh, yeah, Nikita Lyons beat her, and then Keanu James laid her out afterwards. So apparently, there's there's more to come here. Maybe she'll cost them the tag team title tournament match. Get Keanu James on the main roster now. Oh no. Oh, no. Neither of these two are currently ready for national television. No. I'm not saying that anybody needs to be fired or cut. Or they just need to keep learning. That's my point. I don't think Nikita needs to be up there on the live SmackDown doing a tag team championship match. But they, they're they into her. And That's so she's, she's getting this chance. But you know who is great, as we'll get to? Well, we'll get to him. Apollo Crews did a segment with the Creed brothers to set up a match with uh, Roderick Strong. If I hear one person on the chat complain about this match with Roderick Strong and Apollo Crews, like, I don't know what I'm going to do. That match was great. Lash Legend did a segment with Malik Blade backstage, which, boy, did they make it. They, they did something on this show. So then we had uh, the rounds match. It was Wes Lee versus Trick Williams. Okay, and uh, this was I, I still I have absolutely no idea what's uh, they here are the rules they gave us six three minute rounds twenty minute second break between rounds fall can be won by pinfall submission or count out fall occurs the round ends first to two falls is the winner a knockout or DQ automatically ends the match <laughs> although that didn't happen so anyway. The first fall, they both wear boxing gloves, which was incredible because Wes Lee is a hundred times the worker of Trick Williams. But once you put boxing gloves on him, it totally switched. Trick Williams out there, he actually moves like a boxer, and his boxing was actually, it was fine. Wes Lee is just a fish out of water. He didn't know what's going on. And then anytime they actually had to hit each other, it was like the worst. It was, it was like Roddy Piper and Mr. T. It was just a horror. So the first round ends... And they go to the second round, and all of a sudden they got no gloves on. Like, that wasn't in the rules, but it was much better when they had the gloves off. So uh, then uh, I think uh, Williams pinned Lee, and uh, so Trick Williams was up. Then the entire, in round three, was during a commercial break, so I don't know what happened in the round three. Then we go to round four, and uh, we got a loaded glove, and Wesley tries to avoid it. 
and uh, Lee pins him. And, but then after the bell, Trick Williams does a cheap shot, knocks him out after the bell. So then round five opens, and, and he's selling, selling, selling. And then uh, finally there at the end with just a few seconds left, uh, um, I guess it was Wesley grabs the loaded glove, knocks out Trick Williams, and uh, and pins him. This was just like, <laughs> I don't know what this was. I don't know what it was. But I couldn't stop watching it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it was good. Don't get me wrong. But I could not stop watching this train wreck. Because they're so damn entertaining, and that's what Trick Williams definitely has going for him. He and Carmelo Hayes, in different ways, are going to be primetime players for that promotion. And Trick has got something for sure. And when he comes along a lot more in the ring, look out. Then we had uh, Giovanni Vinci comes out, and he challenges Carmelo Hayes for Heat Wave. And uh, that match should be great. We had uh, Ariana Grace and Thea Hale. Thea Hale is the uh, the girl that just graduated high school, and the story was she was going to go to college and train and then come back in four years and wrestle. Well, the college ended up being Chase University. She's already wrestling. But she's been wrestling for several years on the indies. And, uh, you know, God bless Ariana Grace, but Thea Hale worked circles around her. And it wasn't much of a match at all. It was kind of short. And uh, Ariana beat her. But uh, Thea Hale, uh, for being 18... She's she's gonna be good. She was she was totally fine in this match, doing what she had to do. Thea Hale is a great Thea Hale right now. And what did you think about uh, Ariana's worked black eye? Well, better worked than real. <laughs> like poor Solo Sokoa, who sprained his PCL in that match last week, and he will be out six weeks. And he had a short meeting with Cameron Grimes, and he basically said, "Grimes, one of us needs to win this uh, North American title for guys like us." Cameron Grimes went, yeah, and he walks off because he's not sure he's a guy like that anymore. Apollo Crews, Roderick Strong. So uh, Apollo, uh, Roderick Strong had been yelling at the Creeds for watching film with Apollo Crews. He's furious. So they had a big kerfluffle. That's for the Iron Sheik. And uh, they had a match here. It was great. And Apollo Crews beats him clean. And so now Roderick is going to have to go back there and... Uh, and face the humiliation of Apollo Crews helping his guys and then beating him in a match. But this was a very, very good match. I'm sure you're stunned to hear Apollo Crews and Roderick Strong had a great match together. Uh, we also had uh, one final accord. Bros, I don't want to hear it. If you didn't think this was good, I just don't want to hear it. These guys were great. They're outside. They're having a meeting back and forth. Like... On the grand scale of acting and wrestling, these two are these two are good. And the gist of it is, Santos Escobar cannot work with this guy, but he agreed to. Tony D'Angelo wants him to just come back to work and do your job and shut up, and Santos doesn't want to. And so they finally agree that they are going to have a street fight coming up at Heat Wave. And if, uh, if Santos Escobar wins, him and Legato are free. But if he loses, he is out of NXT. But not his guys, only him. He will be out of NXT. And man, I saw this and I was like, brother, please lose. Just like throw the match, dude. Go up to the main roster and be a big time superstar up there. I don't know if that's what they're going to do. I'm praying that he loses. But uh, for all I know, he may win. But anyway, one way or the other, this feud ends at a heat wave. Pretty deadly beat Malik Blade and Edris Anofe. <laughs> they had the Virgin and his crew out there, Fallon Henley, and they got involved, and Lash Legend was there, and uh, they got their uh, pretty deadly one. And the whole key to this is they have put Lash Legend and Pretty Deadly together. Finally, they figured out what to do with her. This is a perfect pairing. It's perfect. She doesn't need to ever work, but she's, like, got loads of personality. And they're total gimmicks. And, like, the three of them together, <laughs> dude, they were awesome. Am I wrong? You are not wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Not wrong at all.
let Tatum Paxley and Lash Legend bash into each other in the background as those other four go at it. It was especially pretty deadly leading that dance. Literally, I think they, they like to dance. They like fashion. They like Lash Legend. And they love to hear her talk, which was the whole point of how they ended up getting to that match. And again, sometimes, look, this it's pro wrestling for heaven's sakes. Give me my comedy. The quick shots of Edra Sanofe standing there with no shirt on and just of course Malik Bla- and Malik Blade with the ridiculous cardigan vest it just the whole dynamic of that whole thing with pretty deadly walking in and lash being there it just it, again Sometimes the stupid things work, dude. That work. There's, there's only got one guy who doesn't like it. And there's no oh. way. There's no way you watch the. If you don't want to watch NXT, if you think it sucks, that's fine. Okay, but don't tell me. Don't tell me that you watch this show and you think that Lash Legend being paired with Pretty Deadly is a bad idea. I don't want to hear it. Then the main event: Zoe Stark and Cora Jade. You realize Zoe Zoe Stark's been wrestling for like a decade. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty damn good. Yeah. And uh, and this was a good match. She was great in this match. Cora Jade was, uh, you know, her, she's got her heel character down. But uh, work-wise, she's still got a little ways to go. But uh, we had Mandy on commentary, and Roxanne Perez shows up. Jade is distracted. Uh, Stark pins. Uh, she gets the pin because obviously she's challenging for the title at Heat Wave. And then we had a, a brawl with Perez and Jade. They're having a match at Heat Wave. Even though last week Jade said she wasn't going to do the match, the match has now been signed. So I don't know how that happened. And then uh, at the very end of the show, it's one of those things in wrestling. I, I think I, I have not heard anything about Mandy, so I presume she's okay. But she hits the ring, and they have a, there's a quick brawl, and Zoe Stark lifts her up, and she does her flipping knee to the face. And Mandy takes a bump. No, there's nothing wrong with the spot. There was nothing wrong with the bump. But what was wrong is the belt was in the ring. And it wasn't flat. It was on its side. And so Mandy's neck fell, boom, right on the edge of that belt. God, that could have been, like, I'm not even joking. That could have been a tragedy. But apparently she was all right. But holy smoke, that was scary. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Let's see what we got here. Freddie Blassie. Pro Wrestling Finishing Holds is a winner. I've used most of these holds to win and regain the WWA World Title five times. Congratulations to my good buddy, Gene LaBelle. Oh, my. Can you imagine Man. sitting in and listening to stories being told between guys like Classy Freddy Blassie and Judo Gene LaBelle? Holy smokes. Incredible. Vern Incredible. Gagne. Both amateur and professional wrestling have been my life and love. The difference being that these holds are not legal in amateur competition, but are a must in the repertoire of every great professional wrestler. Damn right. Damn right. How about Nick Bockwinkle? This book should be banned. I've traveled all over the world to master techniques that LaBelle is showing in his book, Pro Wrestling Finishing Holds. Doesn't he realize this will show my opponents how I've been beating them for years? It's awesome. Awesome. How about how about King Curtis Iakea? <laughs> Everything I learned about wrestling was in the actual like hands you. of Judo Gene LaBelle. That Everything instruction enabled me to become a household name in professional wrestling here in the Pacific. The Pacific My Islands. Thanks to Mr. <laughs> LaBelle. You know who probably learned a little bit from Judo Gene LaBelle? Zoe Stark, and that's how she's going to carry her match alongside Nikita Lyons when they're up on the main roster on SmackDown or Raw or wherever they're deciding to have that little match that they're having there. Probably on SmackDown. Well, we're out of time, but back tomorrow with more. Maybe I'll talk about Ric Flair tomorrow. But anyway, mm-hmm. we got uh, Dynamite tonight. Lots to talk about with Dave later on. Only for subscribers, WrestlingObserver.com. Sign up today. Don't miss out. 13,000 archived shows, including tonight's. And that's it. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.